Remembering, until you have sex as a married couple, the church does not consider you married. So if you can't have an erection, you can't actually get married in the eyes of the church. And that's, 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 the, case, that's the case here too. Because what's Jesus say? Some are, some are un, incapable of marriage at birth. What's he saying? You can't, then he's saying you can't get married because you can't have... He's not gonna, that's the only thing that could be possible that would exclude you from marriage at birth. Mm-hmm. You would never, you wouldn't be married until you have sex. So if you never, if you never had sex, then your marriage wouldn't. Then you, like, okay, so let's say that two people come to me as a priest and they say, Father, we, you know, we got married, you married us, or whatever, four years ago. We've never had, we've never been able to have sex. Bam. There's, you, I don't, you, I think you have to send like a postcard to Rome and. The annulment is through. That's it. There is that. I mean, that's there is no paperwork really. It's you were never married in the eyes of the church. It does, but that's 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 why we say you hear people say consummate the marriage. Okay, that's what they're talking about. When you have sex for the first time, that's consummating the marriage. That's making it finally officially valid. There are a lot of medical techniques out there pills, medicine, so on and so forth, that, can, that, that have made impotence a much less of an issue. Um, but it's still, it still is an issue for some people. Um, but anyway, we can, talk, we, we can talk about that later. But let's, born that way, some are made so by others. Exactly. That means that you're paying attention and you're awake. If you're a man, that should really hurt just to say that. Made so by others. Here's why you would get made that way. Okay, they didn't just, I mean, people didn't get castrated usually just for torture, okay, or for fun. If you were, let's, let's say, for example, you are a prince or a king or whatever, or a governor or you, whatever, you've got, you've got kind of your harem or whatever you want to call it of women back then, okay, you would then, the people that would take care of your women would be eunuchs. They would cut yours off to ensure that you would not do anything with them. Okay? So, that hurts to talk about and think about. I don't know. I don't want to know exactly. I don't know. You there were a hot iron or something would close the wound up. But let's you you ask the question, not me. I don't want to talk about it. What? I don't know. I don't know the biology of castration. Okay. Don't look it up on Google at school because you'll get flagged. Some are a born that way. Some, too, are made that way by others. Part three. Part three of Jesus' speech. Part three of Jesus' speech. Some, because they have renounced marriage for the sake of the kingdom. For the sake of the kingdom. I forgot sake of. Some are born impotent. Some get theirs cut off. Some give up sex for the sake of the kingdom. Kingdom of heaven. Yeah, and we'll get into what, what, what that means, but just know right now, I think it's important to see with the biblical background before we get too far into this, okay? Okay, um, let's look at 1 Timothy 3.2 first, okay? 1 Timothy 3.2. 
Paul says the bishop must be the husband of one wife and must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive. For if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how can he care for God's church? Okay? The husband of one wife. Okay? First of all, one thing that he's saying, and what I want you to do is, um, I don't think I left you enough space. So maybe if you could get out another piece of paper to write these down. I'm going to ask you, I'll give you Timothy 3.2 on the test, but what I'm going to do is ask you, how would the church respond to that? So we need to make sure we understand how the church would respond to some of these. Because it sounds like St. Paul is saying you have to be married. And so then, then people always, this is one of the first passages that people bring up to me if they're asking me, if they don't believe in the priesthood, if they're asking me, well, gosh, St. Paul, don't you know St. Paul and Timothy says you have to be married? Okay, so how would the church respond to that? What's that? No, you don't need all that. I'm just reminding you what it says here. What I want you to know is how would the church respond? Okay? To Timothy 3.2. Okay? And, first of all, it's important to realize, part one, okay, Paul was not just a bishop. He was also... An apostle. So he is, he, Paul considers himself to be one of the, and he is considered by the church to be one of the twelve apostles. Okay, now they actually replaced Judas. So basically, after that, there's essentially 13 apostles who are in good standing. Paul being one of the, the, but he considers himself to be, and the other apostles, if you read the, the Bible, they consider him to be an apostle too. Okay? So Paul. Paul is a bishop, and he's not married. So that's the first thing that the church would say. Paul is not necessarily saying that you have to be married, because he wasn't. And he considered himself to be not only an apostle, not only a bishop, but an apostle. Okay? So he wouldn't then turn around and write a letter... And the, mind, the church would say it would be crazy to turn around and write a letter and say, oh, by the way, you guys all have to be married if you're going to be doing what I'm doing. They would say, well, why aren't you married? Okay? So, he's not married. That would be one of the things that the church would bring up about Timothy 3, too. The other thing is that um, the church argues that he's not saying that a bishop must have a wife. He's saying if he has one, He can only have had one. If, he, if this bishop has had a wife, or has a wife now, he can only have one. Okay? This is the direct quote right here. The husband of one wife. Okay? And so, you can say that that can mean two different things. You can say it means he has to be a, having a wife, or it could mean that he can only have one and not more. And again, the church would point to the fact that Paul is not married. So he's probably not saying that if you're going to be a bishop, you have to be married. But just don't pay attention to me. Okay, that would be kind of crazy to say that. All right, it's hot in here. Let's take a break, get some water. Hey, let's keep rolling here. We got a couple. Anybody ever seen the movie Keep the Faith with Ben Stiller? Okay, we got a couple. And his friend's a rabbi. Yep. What's that? Night at the Museum? Okay. 
So we're looking, what I want you to write down on this piece of paper that you've gotten out is how would the church respond to these, these quotes from the Bible that we've looked at. Okay? How would the church respond to these? What did Corinthians 7.2 say? What did 1 Corinthians 7.2 say, Rod? You wrote it down on your other piece. What did, it, what did we say? What was the summary? Okay, every man should have his own wife, every woman have his own husband. You could hear that and say, St. Paul is, is saying that everyone should be married. What else can you read that, though, and say? Kari? I put every, every, everyone should be married, but there's different codes to marriage. Like, you can be virgin, church, virgin, 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 Okay. What, what really, what St. Paul is saying there for the first time, and again, the Catholic Church, Christianity is, is kind of sometimes vilified for hating women, but really, that is a very new teaching in the sense that, what is, what is the second part of that? Every woman must what? Have her own husband. And every husband must have only his own wife, right? They're saying for the first time, really, anywhere in the world, culturally, okay, this is one of the first teachings where we're saying it's got to be one and one. No harems, no more um, uh, polygamy, no more like one guy with 200 wives or one guy with two wives. Okay, there's no, first of all, we know obviously that there's never been, there was never, it was never the case where there was like a wife with 15 husbands. Okay? So this is elevating the dignity of women and saying, look, no man now is able to have more than one wife. Does this apply, would the church though say that this applies to the priesthood? No, because St. Paul was not married. Okay? St. Paul, again, and the, the church would respond to this Bible passage by saying, St. Paul was not married. That makes sense. It's not St. Paul then can't be saying in this passage that everybody's got to go get married and every woman has to go get married to a husband, because he didn't. He was not married. Okay, so it's not out there saying everybody on the planet has to be married. It's saying one and one, one to one ratio now from now on. Okay, that's what we that's that's what the church says about that one. Okay. Um, let's look then at, we already talked about Matthew. Um, we'll talk, uh, let's see, should we talk about that? Let me talk about that later, okay? Um, if we look at 738 in Corinthians, he who marries does well, he who does not marry does better. First of all, this passage answers the first two that we looked at. Do you see how? You guys okay? We, we need to get out the paddles here or uh, charge up the heart. St. Paul is saying in the same letter, okay, he's answering the question. People were saying earlier, I thought everyone has supposed to get married. People read sometimes 732 and say, oh my God, or 72 and say, okay, it sounds like everybody's supposed to be married. They read Timothy 3, chapter, or verse 2, and they say, oh my gosh, that sounds like he's saying that a bishop has to have a wife. But now he's saying, he who, if you marry, you do well, but if you don't, you do better. Okay? The church talks about that as referring to the priesthood, those who refrain. And we're going to talk about that and why. Why does he use the word better? Is he saying priests and religious nuns and brothers are better than regular? No. He doesn't say that, but we'll get into that later. Okay. What I want to do now is I want to watch these couple of clips from the movie um, Keeping the Faith. Um, it has Edward Norton and Ben Stiller, and I can't think of the lady's name, but um, she was famous back in the day. All right, we're going to watch these two clips, and then we'll...
close the door and not that there's anything back, but just so that I can hear it. I don't know how loud it is. Yes. So you're not gay? Oh, no, no. Are you sure? Yes, but even if I was, the rules are the same. Okay. Right. Do you miss it? Nope. Are you tempted? No. Nah. Oh, admit it. If they changed the rules, you'd be psyched. I don't even think about it. Do you fantasize? I have dreams sometimes, but not really. How is that possible? What, specifically? Well, I've seen the way women look at you, even though they know you're a priest. Especially when they know... I'm not blind, you. okay? Okay, so how do you deal with that? It's not an issue for me. It's really not. It's not. Really? I'm, yeah, I'm past that point. It's. I'm completely committed to what I do. I really am. To my work, to ministering to people. It defines me completely as a person, and and it fulfills me. You know, I'm very happy. Hmm. And and that that particular sacrifice is a, it's a gesture. It's a symbol of my commitment. It's quite a gesture. Yeah, I know it seems that way, but you know, I, it's like when people quit smoking, and and the first year is really tough, and then. People can light up right in front of you and it doesn't even bother you. I quit smoking two years ago. When people smoke in front of me, I want to French kiss them just to suck the smoke out of their lungs, okay? Well, don't I'm, be a priest. God, I really admire your commitment. Well, I don't think I could take it. Well, you've given up all kinds of things for what you do. You... There comes a point where I just crave contact, you know? Like, I, I want to touch someone and be touched. You are amazing. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Thus endeth the sex conversation. Thus endeth. Okay. <laughs> I bet no one ever asked the Dalai Lama these questions. Okay, so um, they're friends going way back to, to uh, childhood, and what happens in the movie is that that he thinks that she's falling in love with him and he starts falling in love with her and he like goes to kiss her one night at, he's the, the priest and she's like, whoa, what are you different vibe, okay and, and so then he has this big crisis where he embarrassed himself and thinks that, thought that she fell in love with him and it didn't, so he goes and talks to his pastor, the older priest okay, and so we're going to watch that scene too, which is also uh, I think very good I remember I fell in love with this girl in Prague. It was in 1968. Oh, she was beautiful. She looked like Carol Lombard. She grabbed me. It was in the alley behind my church. She pressed me against the wall. She kissed me. I felt like Richard Chamberlain in the Thornbirds, you know, in the barn with Maggie. I was so happy I could die. You never told me this. What did anything happen between you? Not really. Flirtations, little moments. But then soon after, the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia, and I moved to the United States. I don't know. I'll tell you something. If she had kissed me back, I don't think I'd be sitting here right now. I would have given it all up. I mean, she didn't, but I don't know. I just, I keep thinking about what you said in the seminary about how, you know, the life of a priest is hard. And if, and if you can see yourself being happy doing anything else, you should do that. <laughs> well, that was my recruitment pitch, which is not bad when you are starting out because it makes you feel like a Marine. The truth is can never tell yourself that there is only one thing you could be. If you're a priest or if you marry a woman, it's the same challenge. You cannot make a real commitment unless you accept that it's a choice that you keep making again and again and again. I've been a priest over 40 years. And I fell in love at least once every decade. You're not going to tell me what to do here, are you? No. God will give you your answer.
Uh, that's the rectory that they live in. Um, also, I think that was just great a great clip, especially the second one. Because in the first one, he's kind of like speaking, I think, a little bit loftily, right? Uh, you know, it, I don't even think about it. Well, yeah, he does. Um, but I think the second scene is very good. It, it kind of sums up our class, okay? He says, um, well, let me ask you, what did you hear from that priest that might also apply to your own life and figuring out what you do? What did you hear the priest say that you liked? Anything jump out at you? Yes. There's going to be challenges either way. Very good. What else? John? Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, he, he says, if you think that you're going to, that, that, that um, once you make your choice that there's going to be no more temptation, then you're, he's like, that's, that's insane. Okay? That is absolutely, if you think, oh, well, when I marry this person, I will never look at any other woman the same. False. Okay? That doesn't happen. If you think, oh, well, I'll get ordained a priest, and then all that other stuff will go away. You know, you know that's not how it happens, okay? He says, first of all, uh, you can never tell yourself there's only one thing you could be. I know a lot of people, and this, first of all, just a little homilette here about you and deciding what you're going to do with your life. I know a lot of people out there right now who are your age, and they come and talk to me or whatever, and they're like, I can't figure out what God's calling me to do. It's the worst thing ever. Like, I, it's just, I, I wake, I stay up all night long worrying about it. And, I, you know, I'm just this anxious ball of mess. Okay? You know what I tell them? Who cares? There's never one thing, okay? Vocation is not so much about, gosh, I've got to pick the right career or else God is going to strike me dead. That's what a lot of people think. Like, if I don't pick the right school, the right career, and I don't choose it freshman year, and I don't just absolutely kill myself working at it, then God's going to strike me dead. And he's like, oh, sitting back, like watching you from behind? I wonder which door they're going to choose. I hope they choose the wrong one so that I can kill them. You know, God doesn't do that. Okay? So if you're that right now, if you're like worried about where you're going to go or what you're going to do, and I'm not saying, oh, we'll just sit back and just do drugs and don't worry about it. You know, when you go to college, like don't work. I'm not saying that, okay? But I'm saying, I think this is, this, that, that priest reminds me of that, and also just people that, that, uh, that I hear from all the time, okay? Don't, don't do that, okay? And if you do start to do that, come back and I'll kick you in, in, the, in the pants, okay? In the rear, get you going again, all right? But that, that's crazy, okay? There's never one thing that God has in mind for you, and that if you don't figure it out, you're going to get killed, Okay? There's never one thing that you can, do, that you can be. All right? if you, he says this, and this is very important too. If you marry or are a priest, it's the same challenge. What does he mean it's the same challenge? It's the same challenge to stay committed. Yep. Okay? Um, this is, I, I like to do this when I'm talking about celibacy. Um, okay? How many, how many people are on the planet? Uh, roughly, give me a, a rough estimation. What is it at? Are we at seven billion yet? I thought we were. Get, I think we we're at seven billion. We're getting close. Okay, so there's seven billion. So how many will, women are there approximately? Three and a half billion women. Okay, there are three and a half billion women on the face of the earth. Okay, number. Um, a priest cannot have sex with three and a half billion. Okay, number a married man man cannot have sex with three mil billion four hundred and ninety nine million. Women. Okay? Or wait. I was a math major too. That's sad. 
Okay. It's right here. Here's one right here that worked. I think this one's good. There we go. When you get a when you get a marker that works, it's like awesome. Okay? So people all the time, I think we'll get to this in a minute about this mindset, okay? But for a married man, there are still three billion four hundred and ninety nine million nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine women that he cannot have sex with on the planet. Okay? So to think that that a married man and I remember when I was in high school, I thought, like, gosh, once I get married, you know, it'll just be sex all the time, and it'll be, that'll be it. You know, like, I just have to get to that point where I'm married, right? Um, but that, I think we realize when we grow older that it's still, even, it's a choice that I have to decide each day, am I going to say I love that person that I married, or am I going to go look for someone else? Okay, because the other people are out there... At, <laughs> as uh, indicated by the fact the number of people who sleep around or cheat on their husbands and wives and so forth, okay, and all the divorces that are out there, okay? All right, so on your, on your little sheet there, let's look at a couple of things that's important to make sure we know what these words mean. Continence means no sex, not having sex. If you're a continent, you're not having sex. It's a biological thing or just a, it's a very black and white term. Continence means no sex, Eunuchs are continent, okay? It doesn't mean there's no spiritual component to it one way or the other necessarily. It's just, I am physically not having sex. And people oftentimes think that that's all celibacy is. It's just a simple no sex thing, okay? Chastity, underneath there, more importantly, chastity is a different word. It also starts with the C. Okay? It's one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Much different than simply not doing something. Chastity is a gift of the Holy Spirit in the mind of the, in the teaching of the church. Okay? It's a way of life that flows from purity and leads to a person living as the best and most balanced possible version of themselves. You don't have to write all of that. But make sure you understand the spiritual component of what chastity is. Chastity is more... It has nothing actually... It, it, first of all, think of, them, think of chastity as something totally different than continence. Okay? Because chastity must be present in marriages as well. Okay, living a chaste life is something that married people do as well. So chastity doesn't mean having sex. Chastity doesn't mean not having sex. Chastity is a calling for both people to live out of this purity. Okay? You can have sex in marriage and it cannot be chaste. And I get that in the confessional. Wherever I'm at, all over the place. Okay? People will come, Father... My wife and I, my husband and I, we had sex. It was not, I, I feel like it was not chaste. I don't ask them questions. Could be, okay, contraception. It could be oral sex. Could be anal sex. Okay, any of those kinds of things. Or it could be that the person, the, 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 the husband, for example, is having sex out of lust. Even just saying, I, I see my wife right now as an object that I want to, to use, and I'm not really worried about her as a person. That is unchast, unchaste, unchastity. Okay? Unchaste. Non-chaste. All right? So chastity is there for marriage and for priesthood. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're having sex. And hey, FYI, you can be unchaste and not having sex. There are priests or whoever, people that aren't having sex, that are still being uncha unchaste. Okay? Now, the final word that I want you to write down there is celibacy. Celibacy, if you think of this as a math problem, is continence plus chastity. 
incontinence plus chastity. That's celibacy. You're not having sex, but you're also not having sex in a way that is chaste. Life-giving. Living my life from a, from a situation of purity. Okay? Does that make sense, those three C words? Make sure you kind of know what they mean and the differences between them. Okay, because that's very important. People will confuse them all the time. Oh yeah, chastity, that means you don't have sex. No, not at all. Actually, married couples that have been married for 50 years and maybe have had sex, I don't even know how many times, are still called to chastity. A, new, a, a husband and wife married, having sex for the first time on their honeymoon, are called to chastity. Okay, are they called to continence? Are, is, is a man and a wife who've just been married, are they called to continence? No, that would be weird. Okay, hi, welcome, you're married, now don't have sex. Okay, obviously not, they're not called to that. Okay, are they called to celibacy? Are married people called to celibacy? Why not? Because you've got to be continent. Okay, you have to, yes, exactly. Okay, you have to be continent. Okay? All right, I don't think we're going to finish everything today, but let's start looking at some of the... We all right? Let's start looking at some of the history. Okay? Because here, again, remembering this narrative that's told about celibacy, it started in the Middle Ages, and in the early church, no, celibacy was never mentioned. Okay? We're going to look at that. Council of Elvira, I'm sure you all are very familiar with that. Okay? In case you have forgotten, the Council of Elvira was in the 4th century. Okay? So in the 300s. Here we have them saying, and you don't have to write this all down, just get the gist of it. It has seemed good, absolutely, it has seemed good, absolutely, to forbid the bishops and priests and deacons to have sexual relations with their wives. Should anyone do so, let him be excluded from the honor of the clergy. How would you summarize that? Priests, bishops, deacons are what? Okay, they're supposed to be celibate, but they're married, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. They're already married, but he's saying it's... They shouldn't be... If they're married, they shouldn't be doing what? Having sex with their wife. Have sex as a bishop or priest. Get kicked out. Exactly. Okay? Council of Carthage, I'm sure another one of yours that you're familiar with. The bishops declare unanimously, bishops, priests, and deacons abstain from conjugal intercourse with their wives so that those who serve at the altar may keep a perfect chastity. Council, what's that? Oh, did I leave that on there? Whoops. Um, I believe that was the 4th century as well. If it's not, I will correct that for you. Okay, so you can write in there 4th century. Um, again, the same, a very similar message. If you're a priest or a bishop and you have a wife, you shouldn't be having sex. Why? Why would they... Let's think about it, first of all, for a second. Let's just say not even that. Why would bishops and priests be allowed to have wives in the three and four hundreds? Why is having wives still an option, although it isn't today, usually? Not really at this point. Not really at this point. Okay, this is a key question. This is a key question. You can write this down on that other sheet of paper if you don't have any room. Okay? Why? Why were bishops and priests married early on in the first place?
This is the last thing I'm going to have you do today. So if you're falling asleep, wake up. Okay. Make sure you get this question down, and I want you to leave knowing the answer to this. These last two councils have talked about bishops and priests being married. Okay, but they also say if you're married, don't have you're not having sex anymore. Okay, yeah. Okay, because people would come over from different religions. Good, that's part of it. But an even bigger part of it is when Jesus and the apostles start spreading the news. Were there, you think there were a bunch of men waiting around who were already not married, waiting to become priests? No. Okay? Recruitment. Early on requires married men as priests. The recruitment effort to try and get people to join up with the priesthood and become bishops, there weren't a lot of young men waiting around. Oh, well, you know what? Hey, I'm, I'm in Antioch in the year 70, and I've just heard about Jesus. Well, that's great, because I didn't get married for 35 years waiting for this. Now I'm ready to be a celibate priest. Okay, no, they were already, most of them were married. Kari, you with us? You need to get this down. Did you write it all down? This? This question? This is important. This is the last thing you need to do today. Okay? Why were bishops and priests married early on in the church's history? Because they needed people to do the work, and most people who were able to do it were already married. People read that all the time. Oh, well, we should... Let priests get married again. I'd rather never be married in the first place than have that dropped on me where I'm married, but now I have to stop having sex for the rest of my life with my wife. Okay? Now, why do they ask them to not have sex? Because, if you understand the Old Testament, which we do, what did the priests have to do, the Old Testament priests? We didn't talk about this, but this is... Before you could go be a priest in the temple or the tent, you could not have sex for a week with your wife. You had to purify yourself and refrain from that. But how often are the priests today serving in the temple? Always. So, priests that are serving always in the temple, like this, this the new priesthood, can never have had sex because... Or, or, or have to stop having sex in order to keep themselves pure. Okay, you guys did a good job. It's really hot in here. Okay, there's no homework tonight. We'll finish this up. We'll talk about women's ordination, and we're almost there.